Good morning and welcome to the induction ceremony for the Stoughton High School Hall of Fame for Extraordinary Achievement. For educators and administrators, there is nothing more rewarding than recognizing individuals who have gone on to do extraordinary things after the education they received in high school, especially Stoughton High School. Today we welcome back Dr. Paula J. Elzuski, class of 1971, to present to her the honor of being inducted into the Hall of Fame for Extraordinary Achievement. The Hall of Fame of Extraordinary Achievement is an elite group of individuals who have gone on to do phenomenal things, have received high-ranking awards and recognitions, have given back to their communities in tremendous ways, and started here at Stoughton High School. I look forward to hearing what Dr. Olszewski has to share with us later on in the program. I would also like to welcome Dr. Olszewski's family and friends to Stoughton High School today to join her for this ceremony. You must be very proud. I also welcome current superintendent, Dr. Rizzi, Former high school principal and former superintendent, Mr. Anthony Elsano. <laughs> national Honor Society officers. <laughs> and the Stoughton Historical Society. I look out at the audience filled with our current students and I wonder what your futures hold. Which of you might cross this stage many years from now and receive this very honor? You each have gifts and talents. Now is the time to discover what they are, to figure out what inspires you, what you wish for, what you hope to accomplish. It starts now, it starts here. I would now like to welcome to the stage Ms. Katie Salucci, President of the National Honor Society, to begin the ceremony. I would like to begin by welcoming Ethan Rawls to the stage, the National Honor Society Community Service Coordinator for the Pledge of Allegiance. Everyone, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Ethan. I would, like, I would now like to have Abigail Roan, the National Honor Society member for the National Anthem. Please stand again for the National Anthem. So proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there 
say does that star spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free and the Thank you, Abby. I would now like to welcome. I would now like to welcome Anthony L. Sarno, uh, former superintendent of schools, for the introduction. Good morning. This program uh, began in, <coughs> excuse me, in 2004. And it began with a, a woman from Stoughton who had great vision for many, many years. Her name was Joanne Blundstrom. She was a member of uh, the Stoughton School Committee when, when I was hired. Uh, and when she left the school committee, she became select woman. And for years, uh, she showed what Stoughton is all about, what your teachers believe and your administrators believe in the Stoughton Public Schools. There's no place like the town of Stoughton and the Stoughton Public Schools, and I'm very proud to be a, have been a part of it for so many years. And I want to give you a little history because it's a partnership with the Stoughton Historical Society. And Joanne Blundstrom representing them, she called me in, in, when I was superintendent in 2003, and she said to me, we have so many graduates from Stoughton High School that we should let, that have done very, very well, and we should let the town of Stoughton and the Stoughton school system, and especially the Stoughton students, know what kind of an education that they can get in the Stoughton public schools. And so we started a, uh, we organized the committee, we worked on it a year, and we came up with the Stoughton Hall of Fame for extraordinary achievement, and it's extraordinary it is. We have the founder of, of D'Angelo's, we have the founder of um, Honeydew, we have generals, we have chief of staffs, we have the lead lawyer uh, for, uh, for uh, Time Warner, we have one of three renowned uh, scientists for stem cell research in the world, all graduating from, from Stoughton High School. And there are many, many more as listed in your, in your program. And I'm very, very proud of Paula. I was actually, I hate to say it, I was Paula's class advisor uh, in 1971. But um, that's just a, a little history of, of, the, of the program. And I want to mention Joanne Blundstrom again, because if I had to put a tag on her or a title, I would say that she is certainly Mrs. Stoughton, because for years, she's not only proud of the town, but she is proud of you, both past and current students. And we owe her a, a, a great deal of, of uh, thanks. Thank you very much. I would now like to welcome Ashlyn Crean, National Honor Society Secretary, who will be introducing Dr. Paula J. Olszewski. Dr. Paula Olszewski graduated from Stoughton High School in 1971 as valedictorian of her class. She then went on to Yale, graduating in 1975 as a member of the third entering co-ed class. Olszewski later went on to MIT, where she received her doctorate in chemistry. Soon after, she had the privilege of serving as the president of the MIT Alumni Association and as a member of the MIT Corporation. 
Olszewski thanks her chemistry teacher, Mr. Richard Holbert, and her English teacher, Mr. Carol Mooton, for her dedication and success. Mr. Carol Mooton convinced Olszewski to apply to Yale, a suggestion that she is truly thankful for. As a result, she has been a dedicated fundraiser for Yale, allowing her to receive four awards from fundraising, two from Yale, the Chairsman Award, one from MIT, the Kane Award, and one from a local charity. Olszewski is currently the program director of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. This foundation is responsible for over $117 million in grant funding to develop a new program to elucidate the chemistry of the human habitat, an initiative aimed at developing new basic science research program to understand the chemistry of the indoor spaces where people live and work. Paula Zuski's successes in science and dedication to philanthropy are truly achievements. Dr. Paula Ozuski. Well, good morning. It's a real honor to be here. I thank the selection committee for selecting me. I thank uh, Mrs. Malmstrom for actually setting this up. And actually, she was one of my fans um, early on. Um, you know, back when you don't think people are keeping an eye on you, she actually kept an eye on me. So anyway, um, let's go back here. We've got to start at the beginning here. All right, so the title of my talk and what I have on the plaque, it took a long time for me to figure out what I wanted. Ooh, it's like we're, we've got to go back here. Oh, going the wrong way, you're getting the key. Okay, so let me step away from this and use this technique. So just shows when you're in the Hall of Fame, you can still be bumbling at the mic. Anyway, um, so I want to talk to you today about uh, basically sort of four parts of my life, being a scientist, being a feminist, being a fundraiser, and being a foundation leader. And um, I hope you find it interesting. Um, so they're basically, now I can't use the thing, okay. Um, basically, sort of there are some themes that go through my talk. So the English teachers here and the people, you know, what are the themes of the presentation? Basically, who am I? What motivates me? And what actually do I do? And so for the people who really didn't want to come to this seminar, um, I'll give you the answer right away. The keys to my success are perseverance, just really staying with it, hard work, which does not necessarily mean endless hours of work, but really focusing on a problem and addressing it, in often in efficient ways, and being open to things, like being open. Like I bet there are a lot of Patriots fans here. And I bet they weren't necessarily being open last night in case the Jets beat them. Okay, so that's like an example of being open. You can still be a Patriots fan, but you know, maybe you could be a Jets fan. All right, so how did I get from here? And here is one of my favorite photographs. I loved being a majorette. I was not that good at it. I loved it. I didn't practice that much at it. But here I am. I'm probably a sophomore or junior at Stoughton High. Okay, so I'm on the majorettes, I'm on the field hockey team, I was the goalie. Again, I wasn't that good at it, but I liked it. If I practiced more, I would have been good at it. I was on the math team, did a lot of math problems. Um, I was in the honor society, I studied a lot. But I also worked at Marshalls, I don't know if it still exists, but I was, a, I was in the men's department folding clothes, I was a cashier, and then ultimately I got to work at the service desk. They saw that I could deal with people who had crazy problems about their layaway or returning things. So anyway, I bet there are a lot of people here who are on various teams, they either like studying or don't, they like their sport or they don't, they have a job because they need the money, and anyway, so it's, it's great. So here I am in Stoughton, so how did I get to New York City? Here's a picture, Rockefeller Center, the Christmas tree. This is where people come for vacations. How did I do it? Well, let's see. How, I'll go back to this. Is this? Okay. Okay, now we're back. All right, so here I am growing up in Stoughton. My sister on the far left, actually that dress was really red, but back then they took the pe 
pictures in black and white and they color colorize them. So my sister's here today, my brother in the middle, he's in California, couldn't come, and there I am in what looks like a pink dress, but really was a blue dress. I was very happy living in Stoughton, very you know, nice childhood, nice friends, went to the West Elementary School, then my, when we lived on Kenmore Road, then we moved to Mahoney Avenue, and it was traumatic for me because I had to go to a different uh, elementary school, which was then called the Shemung Hill School, became the Helen Hansen School. She was our principal. She's a Hall of Famer. Um, you know, it was really, a, you know, it was good. Um, my parents, my sister, brother, everything's good. My parents, though, they were really a source of encouragement and inspiration. My father is here today. He probably doesn't look like this picture of him uh, with the towel. And, uh, but I'm happy he's here today. My mother's here in spirit. She passed away th 30 years ago, but she, she resides in Stoughton in the cemetery, um, St. Mary's Cemetery. But they always encouraged me. And one of the things my mother would always say to me is like, just because you think you're so smart doesn't mean you know everything. And actually, it's very important in the work that I do today because I have to work on things that people don't know about. So if I spent my life just thinking about what I knew, I actually would not be that successful. So anyway, let's keep going. So let's talk about my teachers in Stoughton. First of all, Miss French. Miss French, I had in junior high, I know you call that middle school. She was one of those tough teachers. Whatever you did, it can't you do a better job? Okay, so I survived junior high, get to high school. Who's my teacher again? Miss French. I don't know how many years I had her, but when I was rummaging through things um, that somehow I managed to save, Miss French actually had me writing essays on really interesting topics. So I'm sorry that she's no longer with us, but she was, again, one of those teachers. I didn't know I liked her, and I didn't realize how much she helped me until much later. Next, I want to talk about Mr. Holbert. He was a chemistry teacher. He was terrific. He really just showed me the beauty of chemistry. He, we had labs. I feel like I was in the lab a lot, uh, but that's sort of a theme in the first half of my life. Again, the molecules, the electrons, it's all very exciting. The labs, it just was really interesting to me. So, Gee, I, and all along I liked science. I mean, I thought I wanted to be a botanist. I had my parents, again, we didn't have much money, but they bought me the um, greenhouse. I had the chemistry set. I had the microscope. So even though they did not have the benefit of a college education, okay, they have this nerdy daughter, and she wants all these things, and I got them, and I really enjoyed them. So let's talk about Mr. Moulton. He's one of those teachers that comes out of nowhere for one year at Stoughton High School. And he had graduated from Harvard in like three years. He shows up, he's my junior year English teacher, takes an interest in me, looks at my SAT verbal scores, and says, Paula, you can do so much better. Okay, I mean, I was great in the sciences and math. So anyway, he started giving me vocabulary words. He took an interest in me. And he also said, I want you and your parents to go to this meeting in Boston from the Yale admissions office. Okay, so Yale. Who from Stoughton ever went there? I mean, gee, it's like so far away. It's in Connecticut. It's in a different state. Um, you know, it's expensive. They're starting to take girls. Okay, so my parents and I go to this thing, and it sounds really exciting. And what really um, made a difference to my parents was that they said, if your child gets in, we will make sure that they have the financial aid to go here. So I, it wasn't like I was going to try for something I couldn't afford. And what's great, there are still 70 schools in the country today that have that policy. So you have to have really good grades. You have to be a compelling case. But if you get in, someone else pays your way. And that's, that's really wonderful. Okay, so, but now actually I had to, I, you know, had to get in. But let's talk about fairness. You know, um, my faith is important. I made my first Holy Communion at the um, Immaculate Conception Church, whatever. Heard from people I hadn't heard from who made my first Holy Communion with me and this, um, in honor of this award. But I thought I'd give four examples of things that I started thinking about in high school. Okay, I know we have a lot of athletes here from different teams, okay? I hope everybody has good uniforms. But back in the late 60s, it's time to, all right, we're, we're going to go have the field hockey game. We had to go into these boxes and pull out these old tattered uniforms. And I said, what 
wait a second, why is the field hockey team in these other, and I won't even say which teams had good uniforms, but it wasn't the girls' field hockey team. Okay, so I'm getting really excited about Yale, and people are saying, girls should not take the place of boys at Yale. Why? If I'm smarter, shouldn't I get to go there? So that was really annoying to me. Okay, then another one. Okay, if you want to buy a house, you need to be married because they're not going to count your income, even if you have it, so you can't get a mortgage. What? Does this make any sense? And oh, here's another good one. Why were people saying bad things of black people or anyone else as a minority? Mr. Holbert, one of the most important people in my life was black. I had Renee uh, White, I was lining up for years when we had to line up by height. She, I wasn't talking with her for years. The, you know, I just didn't get it. So anyway, I, was, um, I had a lot on my mind as I was studying and majorettes and field talking and working at Marshalls. Okay, so now I've got to apply to Yale. And again, some people in here are applying to colleges. Okay, so I already told you Mr. Moulton is tutoring me in vocabulary words. Wow, my SAT scores went up by 100 points, then another, th like suddenly I've got a high SAT verbal score. My parents just said, Paula, you can do it. Just go for it, just go for it. And again, if I got in, I knew, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm earning, I don't know what they paid me at Marshalls, but we didn't have a lot of money, okay. But if I got in, someone would pay. So I was really driven. I know, I probably can figure out I'm driven to be the best in a lot of things. But remember, they had to f train a thousand male leaders each year. Yale went co-ed in 1969. This is, I'm now applying in 1970. So there aren't a lot of slots. Okay, but you know, if you don't try, you'll never know if you get in. But I got in. I was in seventh heaven. I could not believe it. Now here's a great picture of me. I don't know if anybody found this in the Stoughton archives, but I made it on the front page of the Patriot Ledger, my graduation. And if you look carefully, it also is going to refer to my graduation speech. So in one sense, here I am. I thought I actually looked pretty good in the picture. I'm both liberated and going to Yale. So this was front page news. So I'm the valedictorian. And again, this is one of those things, like someone comes up to me and says, oh, by the way, you're the valedictorian. I was always striving to be the best, but it wasn't like, what's my grade point average? I mean, it's all about learning the material. It's about mastering. And certain th if you work at most things, you'll be good at it. Like I said, I wasn't working at field hockey. I wasn't going to go play field hockey in college. But I worked. At, I studied hard. All right. So now let's hear about my high school graduation speech, which was also big news. 349 graduates here plea for sexual equality. Come on, people are giving me a hard time about going to Yale. Women can't get a mortgage. We have bad, and that, it's like, what else am I going to talk about? Of course I'm going to talk about sexism. And then below, it, the, actually, uh, whatever, I think that was the Stoughton Chronicle. I don't know if it still exists. But they actually published my entire speech, and I found it. And what is both makes me real happy, but also is distressing, is I could give the same speech today, because so many things, a million years later, still need to improve. But anyway, that's why I'm here, and I'm still trying to improve the world. All right. So here I am. I go to Yale. This is unbelievable. At all colleges, okay, you know, you have the same books, okay, classrooms, you might have better labs, but what really was remarkable to me going to Yale is the people, the people I was living with, just people from all parts of the country, people who thought very differently, challenged the way I thought about things. Oh my God, in Stoughton, everybody went to church there. I'm getting a hard time for going to church. Uh, my Boston accent, I was packing cars my first week. It was gone by the second week, okay? Because people are like, what are you? Did you really talk like that? Even Mr. Sarno noticed that I no longer had my Boston accent. Uh, the, the professors I had were extraordinary. They wrote books. They published important research, and suddenly they're teaching me their subject. It was truly remarkable. All right? Okay, now I'm in this. Okay, I should be here. Okay, and I also told you I fell in love with chemistry in high school thanks to Mr. Holbert. So I was in the lab. I, I, the, it was great. I just, I, lo I really enjoyed doing lab work. I, this actually, one of my professors, at Yale, knew, I went up to him. I actually am somewhat fearless and I'll talk to anybody. 
Uh, but, and I get that from my father. But anyway, I asked the professor, I said, you know, I live in the Boston area. Is there any way I can get it? Because I needed to work. The summer after my freshman year, I, was, I worked in the storm window factory over in Easton, okay? So, um, and, I, and I got the money, but actually it would be better if I'm working in a lab in Boston. So the professor said, okay, here, write to these, prof you know, people. So I had to write to some famous people. And lo and behold, I got an interview. I went there got the job. I was like so excited that someone outside of school was going to pay me to do science. So anyway, now during this time I met my husband who's also here today and I have to say we've been married for 37 years, I would not be here without his inspiration and encouragement. So I was very lucky I met Okay, I'm going to tell you one story about some mean girls from the National Honor Society. Okay, so, okay, there are mean girls everywhere. I'm in the bathroom in the old building, and these two girls from the, I've gotten into Yale, these two girls come up to me and say, the, all right, I told you, only 270 girls in the entire country are going to Yale, and they say to me, the only reason you got in is because you're the type of girl they want their graduates to marry. I think that's great. <laughs> At the time, I was furious. But anyway, just shows time. Anyway, so my husband's here. Okay, so let's talk about chemistry at Yale. Oh, and I, you know, it's like you can ask me questions, but let me run through the talk, and then I'll answer any questions about anything. So again, you already know that I, thanks to Mr. Holbert and my parents buying me the chemistry set, that I really like molecules and electrons. And then I can't believe it, actually, actually paid to do lab work. And again, at places like Yale, a lot of the student job, again, because I have a scholarship, but I also need to work, you're doing things that you'd probably be doing anyway, except somehow that you get paid for it. Okay, but Yale had, um, you know, had uh, been founded in 1701 as a men's school. They really have men. They still have a problem with a men on the faculty. They went co-ed in 1969. But, Chemistry pre professors were all men. Most of the students were boys. And I started thinking, like, did I fit in? Did I fit in? But fortunately, my boyfriend at the time, now my husband, would say, just don't worry about it, Paula. Just, like, don't worry about it. So I didn't. And I got into MIT, and I got my PhD there. And so here's a picture. I, let's see if we can find me. You probably can. Um, oops. Well, let's go back. See, it just proves that... Okay, here I am. Okay, here I am. One of the things, when you go and get a PhD in a lab science, you basically spend four, five, or six years in the lab day and night. And that was a very different experience from Yale. But it's, it's sort of like an apprenticeship system. Like until you really immerse yourself in the subject, you can't get... But what's fun is just last week, my husband and I got together with Greg, Pat, and Jed, because they're still, and some of the other people were invited, we all got together as sort of a reunion. So you, you form uh, lasting relationships. So anyway, I get the PhD in chemistry at MIT. Now one of the problems though, when I went there, is, uh, so I talked to my Yale professors, and okay, great, Paul is going to MIT in chemistry. And I said, oh, is there anything I need to know? And they said, oh wait, here are the labs that don't take women. So I said, okay. I guess I won't be interested in Professor so-and-so's lab. But I mean, come on, this is terrible. But anyway, fortunately, this lab did take women, and um, it wasn't an issue for me to be a woman in the lab. Unfortunately, that still is a problem in certain places. OK, so I finished my PhD. My husband is finishing up his um, work. And we're moving to New York City. now. I grew up in Stoughton. Who cares about New York City? They're all fast talking. They're Yankee fans. They can be abrupt. I hope I don't have too many of these characteristics now. But my attitude, and again, going back to the beginning, you know, perseverance, hard work, and being open. Okay. You can live anywhere for a few years. My husband and I both had some great opportunities for our careers. We had friends there. But Anytime you're making one of these moves, there are always disadvantages. It was New York City. It was fast paced, and it had the New York Yankees. And I was a Red Sox fan based on my mother's love for the Red Sox, Carl Yastrzemski, Paula Olszewski. Do you think we're related? I would like, to, but anyway, 
Um, when I was a little girl, he was the star. Um, when I was in graduate school with the, got one of the people in the lab, we got up early because back then you could wait in line for World Series tickets, so I saw the sunrise over Fenway Park. So, in fact, one of the reasons I think my husband started dating me was because I was a Red Sox fan. Anyway, so we've got to, I know, are there any Red Sox fans here? All right, good, good. It was a tough year for the Red Sox and it was a tough year for the Yankees. All right, so remember, okay, so I'm moving to New York, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna persevere, I'm gonna have hard work, I'm gonna be open. So let's see what happens to me. I became the mother of Yankee fans. Here I am, the Yankee fan on the left is here, the Yankee fan on the right is not here. I am probably one of the few people in this audience who can happily wear a Yankee hat in New York, but when I'm in New England, I can wear a Red Sox hat. So does, what does that say about me? Am I open? Or, or does that say, this is what people in New York are like, you can't trust them. All right, so some things changed when I moved to New York. Like I said, I'm the mother of Yankee fans. My family, um, for vacations, we went camping. And I don't know if anybody's here, their family goes camping. But even though we live in New York City, we still go camping at Herman Island in Maine. And so here's a picture of my husband and daughters. And so, all right, so we're living in fast-paced New York, but we go camping in Maine. But there's a, a difference, and that was packing. So here we are getting ready. I live in an apartment on the 14th floor, and you don't have a garage. You can't just, so you have to pack your stuff in tote bags. So if you see, you know, you see some sleeping bags here. So anyway, so as my mother would say, you can take the girl out of Stoughton, but you can't take Stoughton out of the girl. So again, this was something I love doing in Stoughton, and I'm still doing. All right, so where are we? So again, I've mentioned my daughters. Okay, my parents, my... Uh, my husband and my daughters. I, hey, you know what? What did you expect from that high school picture? Come on, you, you knew. And you knew I chose well for a husband. But it's about brains right now. All right? And, but I think that, um, and it's also about using all of your talents. Whatever your talents, you've got to use them. And so, whether it's working or being a parent. And I, and I love being a mother. And since I was an efficient worker, I could continue to work hard as well as be a good mother. And um, my daughter Vivian, I don't know what we were doing, uh, but she said, to, she looks at me and says, but mom, when will you have time to do your work? And I'm like, Vivian, don't worry about that. So anyway, so I'm truly blessed between work and family. Okay, but there's more than just work and family. And my mother always said, Paula, you've got to do things out of the goodness of your heart. It's not because you're going to get paid, but it's the right thing to do. You have so many, even Stoughton, I mean, at all times in my life, what am I doing to help other people? And um, so that, you know, when I was at Yale, I, I tutored high school students in math. I was a brownie troop leader and I was a big sister. Okay, so now what do I do for volunteering? Okay, you heard that I'm an award-winning fundraiser. Well, let's talk about Yale. Who paid for my Yale education? I have no idea, okay? So the fact that I go after all sorts of people in my class, getting money from them so that people like you, if you can get in, can go there for a free ride, Hey, that keeps me going, and I'm working on my 40th reunion, so after this talk, I better call up a few of those rich people so they give the money for the scholarships. Similarly, when I went to MIT, I did not pay for my education. MIT and our tax dollars paid for me to get a PhD. It paid for my living expenses, my food, my lab work. It wasn't a lot, but I did not have to pay to get... So, I mean... Sounds pretty good. All right, so MIT is a great place. I mean, it wasn't as much fun as Yale, but like, they need money, and the I want the chemistry department to do well. And then that also translated into local charities. And in one of the other awards I got was for fundraising uh, to teach kids how to swim. Both of my daughters were competitive swimmers. I was a very active swim mother, as you speak. But anyway, swimming was important. I was traumatized. I learned how to swim at the Y in Brockton. But I really hope the new school has a pool. 
All right, so let's, oh, and also as a volunteer, I got to become the MIT Alumni Association president and a trustee for a member of the corporation. Come on, nice girl from Stoughton. I'm, not, I'm the president of 100,000 really smart alumni. I'm on this board of 70 people that are, are like, these people are unbelievable. They're the captains of industry. They're into all sorts of academics. And I'm there, be, you know, making decisions with them, saying, well, why aren't there more women on the faculty in the chemical engineering department? What's the story here? When I was here, 6% of the graduate students were minorities. Now, it's still 6%? What is wrong with this place? So I think a number of people found me to be a thorn in their side, but you know, you can't be complacent. This is ridiculous. They have to have more women. They have to have more minorities. So anyway, in case you want to know what I did when I was the Alumni Association president and on the corporation, that's what I did. Because, I mean, I, I didn't have gazillions of dollars to give buildings, okay? I didn't know... I don't know that much about finances. I can't say, oh, this is what you have to do to keep the school financially running. So anyway, so that's what I did. Okay, so now let's talk about my day job. I hope everybody in this room ultimately can find a job where it's so interesting and so much fun, you would want to do it even if you didn't get paid. That's my job. Now, here, you saw this picture earlier. It's Rockefeller Center in New York City. I have an office, okay, let's see if I can use the technique. Okay, my office is over here. If you look through here, I have a view of Central Park. I, you know, it's right off of Fifth Avenue. It's amazing. Now, why do I have a fancy office? Because I work for a philanthropic foundation. The foundation has $2 billion in assets and is supposed to give away 5% of that every year. The man who made all the money was Mr. Alfred P. Sloan. He went to MIT. He then turned General Motors into a major corporation. And so he was the Bill Gates of his time. So I was over. So anyway, so we, we give grants. And based, the broad categories are research and education in STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, also economics, and math. So research and education, giving money away. How did I get my job there? Well, another message that I want to give to you, that life is a job interview. I went over there to help someone get a grant. I didn't even know there was work like this. Uh, three months later, I was working at the Sloan Foundation. So basically, what do I do there, aside from sitting in this really fancy office? and having a wonderful assistant who is here today because I, I t said you have to come as a business trip. The reason I'm getting this award is of all the stuff I did with you. So anyway. All right, so what do I do? So I have to identify problems. Remember my mother said, you know, you don't know everything. Well, actually, that's very important in this work because the Sloan Foundation does not want to fund research or education that someone else is funding, such as the government and so on. Okay, so I identify problems. Then I have to find people to work on them. So lots of times, really good people are so busy working on their own problems, they don't care if this, someone from the Sloan Foundation shows up with money and says, well, gee, you know, do, do you want to have a grant to work on this? So I actually have to find the smart people and convince them to work on the project. If they just take the money and aren't interested, it's not worth it to me. Because what I need these people, to, the problems that they're working on are so difficult, so that at 11 o'clock at night, I don't want them to watch the news. I want them to be working on the problems that they're working on. But again, these people that I'm funding, they're interested in this stuff. So at 11 o'clock at night, they're still working on their research. And then, once I give them the money, I try to help them succeed. Okay, because, and when I start talking about some of the projects, it's, they're hard projects. So, in my portfolio, I don't, I don't remember exactly how much I've given away, um, because I've given away more since the number, but it's well over 100 million, it's probably over 120 or 130 million. But it's not the dollar value, it's actually what you do with it. We're not a bank, we're not looking for like how much you make back. We're investing in, in people and projects. But the program directors all read the other uh, grants, so I, you know, we've given away well over a billion, maybe two billion in my 14 years there. Now, come on, when I was at Stoughton High, did I think I was going to be give, have under my control more money than it costs to build a new high school? Come on, this is great. 
All right, so now this is like being open, being open. So these are all my program areas at the Sloan Foundation. Bioterrorism and biosecurity, I ran that program for 10 years. All right, bioterrorism, using disease as a weapon. We'll talk about that some more. And fortunately, my, the good work of my grantees, they're actually working on Ebola right now. All right, so theoretical neurobiology. Okay, I inherited this program. They said, oh, can you take over the theoretical neurobiology? I said, well, I'm not a neurobiologist and I'm not a theoretician, but sure. But again, being open, I studied and you know, ran, ran that program for three years when it ended. Uh, we have the synthetic biology program that we're ending right now. So if you no longer need biological material to create it, everything's been sequenced now, it's in a database, you just take that sequence down, put it in a little machine that makes sequences, and you can make life forms again. Are there issues? Are there risks associated with that? So that's my synthetic biology program. Um, and then I have two basic science programs, the microbiology of the built environment, which I'll talk about. Chemistry of the human habitat. Oh, this goes back to my love of chemistry. I feel like I'm paying back Mr. Holbert, my professors at Yale and MIT. Finally going to spend, I've spent probably only $600,000 of the Sloan Foundation's money on chemistry. And then the other thing I get to do at Sloan is, all right, you figured out, I move, I, as much as I love living in Stoughton, I'm happy living in New York. And I run our civic program. So we do things in Stoughton that we might not do, do things, oh, I wish we could do them in Stoughton. We do things in New York that we don't do else. So I run a program to give awards to outstanding math and science teachers. Isn't that great? I get to go around town. The teachers who win get a check for, I think, $5,000. The school gets $2,500. They have an assembly. Oh, come on. That is so much fun. Okay, um, I've done some, I, most recently, okay, so you know I really have no patience for these fields that are hostile to women. Let's talk about cyber security, coding. So one of my recent grants, only 20,000, but there's a, a program at, um, in Brooklyn to get high school girls to code and, and expose them to careers in cybersecurity. So I was talking to the people and they're like, well, gee, we had 75 girls apply and the girls need to have like, I don't know, a B plus or an A minus average. They have to be really good in math. We had 75 girls apply, but we only do 20. I'm like, you know, isn't this why I'm in the philanthropic world? At least let me pay for another 20. It was like so much fun. And these girls were from all over the city and some were from New Jersey. They're getting up and who knows? I don't know if they're going to go into coding or whatever, but hey, they had a chance. All right. So now let me talk about what I'm supposed to be talking about. Okay, on my plaque, it says fighting terrorism. Most of the terrorism that I've fought over my careers and I continue to do as a consultant to the U.S. government is to fight bioterrorism. I've literally traveled all over the world to do this. This is a photo of me with the Secretary General of Interpol, Ron Noble, nice guy from New Jersey who went to the University of New Hampshire and then went to Stanford Law School. Okay, so again, he... I'm sure for his high school, he could be standing up and getting an award too. So I mentioned earlier, bioterrorism is using germs to do harm. And the program at the Sloan Foundation was designed to sort of just reduce the threat. Now, what does that mean? Again, we're working on hard problems. I've got to figure out what people are doing. And we, we were working in this area in 2000. I joined the foundation in 2000. I thought I joined to run a program in biotechnology. My first day on the job, my new boss says, Paula, how'd you like to work in bioterrorism? And I said, great, I'd love to. What do I have to do? He said, oh, we just funded these people in Baltimore. Learn what they're doing. Go study and come back. So I go back into my fabulous office with big expense account, and I am being paid to study? Okay, I know not everyone in here likes to study, but you know what? I always like studying. So I'm sitting there, like, studying. I, like, I can't believe how wonderful this is. So anyway, so we did a number of things, and as I said, um, I can't, don't have time to talk about all of them, but one of the programs we did was if you can prevent people from using disease 
to kill people, if you can prevent the problem, it's much better. It's like if we can prevent problems with Ebola, it's much better than dealing with it. So um, I met with the Secretary General of Interpol. Come on, isn't this fun? I've been reading spy novels and crime novels for years. Suddenly, nice girl from Stoughton is with the head of Interpol, I, with his bodyguards. It's really pretty amazing. So he said, look, I want to reduce the threat. I want to have a prevention program. He said, and so we're talking about it, and I said, he doesn't know that much about bioterrorism. I know more than he does, but I don't really know that much about police work and law enforcement. So basically, um, we worked together and established a program that now uh, other governments fund because it's so important that brings together law enforcement, public health, and scientists. So it's a multidisciplinary program. And one of the challenges, and I bet this is true at Stoughton High, is the people who are going in law enforcement are sitting at one table in lunchroom. The people who want to go into public health are at another table. And then the people who are going into science are somewhere. And they really don't want to talk to each other. And oh my God, they're going to work worldwide together? So anyway, but that's also, I realize, one of my gifts is that I can work with people from all different fields and get them to work together. Because, and again, I think it goes back to all things are interesting, what you just have to learn about it. So anyway, here I'm fighting terrorism with Interpol and hopefully they're doing a good job. But you know, and I told you how much fun my job is here and I have to stop leaning on this, um, let's see, okay. Here, here's part of one of my work trips. I am in Oman. It is the country just east of Saudi Arabia, okay? Come on, you believe I'm doing this on a business trip? All right, so my, I told my husband, come on this trip with me. Uh, you know, it, we're going to the Arab world, and supposedly they're not that hostile to women, although several times during the conference, no one would sit next to me. But I was the funder, so they had to pay attention to me. So anyway, so this picture, we're with the Royal Omani Police, as well as Interpol, in the desert, having fun on camels. So anyways, and I literally, when my children were at home, I did not take these trips. But hey, once the second one went off to college, hey, I went for, let's see, I also went to Paraguay. I do not have any pictures from that. I do not recommend that country at all. But Oman was fun. <laughs> uh, no, I was terrified. When the, the plane is landing and it's like a corrugated runway, I literally am praying that I will survive. Okay, so let's talk about something else that's on the Stoughton Town website. Something that was one of my projects. So... I told you I was working on bioterrorism pre-September 11th and anthrax attacks. Okay, so once we, the country had anthrax attacks, the foundation, I said to my, my boss and I said, maybe we're done. We've been, we have a bio attack. Maybe all people will pay attention to it and we can spend our money on something else. But what we noticed is no one was telling people what, giving people advice. So I bought, and since I was already working on bioterrorism, even though people said, why are you wasting your time on it pre-September uh, 11th, I, the, I knew people in the White House who would be working on this that now were big deals, but they were just ordinary people uh, before September 11th. So we got together with two people from the White House, my boss and I, and people from this group called the Advertising Ca Council. And they run ad campaigns. So we developed Ready.gov. It lives to this day. It's probably the most successful public service um, education um, campaign that the US government runs. And basically, it doesn't matter what, what your disaster is. And the next time there's a hurricane, people are going to be sending you to Ready.gov. And I can assure you, you need a plan. I have a family communication plan. You need supplies. I have three days of water in my apartment, even though we don't have that much room. And you need to be informed. I have the transistor radio, and I've thought about things in advance. So anyway, well, I was so happy that Stoughton tells their citizens to use this site. It's not nearly as exciting as traveling around with Interpol, but I bet more people in this room will benefit from ready.gov than or already have, and they don't even know that a nice girl from Stoughton got it started. Okay, so now let's talk about report cards. I got a new boss in 2007, um, an MIT professor. Great, I love professors. I fund them all the time. And he said, how do we know we're effective? You know, we're giving away this money. How do we know we're effective? Okay, let's end. Let's evaluate the bioterrorism program. And also we changed the name to biosecurity because like, were we really worried about terrorism? Maybe we were worried about naturally occurring. 
I still worry about terrorism. I still work on committees because I, I, I know enough and I work on bioterrorism. But that doesn't mean the Sloan Foundation needs to. So anyway, we bring in, we have to find some people who don't know me. As you can imagine, um, I have a lot of fans in the bioterrorism arena. Um, and I had to find some people who were knowledgeable in bioterrorism, did not know me, and they were going to give me a report card. Okay, how many people here like getting their report card? Okay, so we got a couple people here. Okay. I can tell you my report card was great in Stoughton High School. In Yale, my report card was good enough to get me into MIT. In MIT, you really didn't have a report card. You either got a PhD or not. So anyway, now suddenly I'm in that fancy office with the big expense account traveling around the world, shaking in my boots. What was my report card going to say? Okay, anybody want to know what I got? All A's. All right, so here, I need to throw this slide in. This was actually, it's a program, but the, I, I knew I had to, to I was at a, a conference in Australia, and we're having like this opening reception, and I see this naked painted man walking through the lobby of the hotel. I was like, whoa, what is going on here? I go in, and again, since I'm a funder, I, you know, give the money for the conference, People treat me like a queen. But the problem is I have to be on guard all the time because I'm trying to do the right thing, not just give money to people who flatter me or, and so on. Next thing I know, I'm with Russell, because again, I'm there, the funder of the conference. Who knew, I can't remember what Russell's day job was, but anyway, so you can tell I have fun. And again, I'm on a business trip in, in Sydney, Australia. Okay, so now we're gonna switch to science. I've given you a taste of things. So. I'm, I am a really well-trained scientist. I'm a clear thinker. But you know what? I'm so interested in so many things. Like, it really didn't matter what I worked on in the lab. And that was, it was troubling to me earlier in my career when I was at a, I was taking a class at MIT and this professor was going through this biochemical pathway and he's saying, you know, we'll go from A to B to C and then he says, and you know, we don't know how to get to D. And when I get to the gates of St. Peter, that's the first question. How do we transform the molecule from C to D? And I said, that's ridiculous. <laughs> so um, anyway, I still managed to get my PhD, but you know, I clearly wasn't that focused on any one problem. Okay, so anyway, so. Uh, you know, so I go to the Sloan Foundation. I think I'm going to start new programs in basic science and biotechnology. I get diverted by bioterrorism. Um, but I really want to start a basic science program. So the program uh, that I started came out of the bioterrorism program. Uh, one of the things that we were trying to do, again, if you, if you think people are going to kill us with bio threats by spraying them in the air, and you say, well, people spend most of their time in the buildings. What can we do to the buildings so that most of the threat agents are removed by the HVAC system? Well, so you start thinking about that. You're like, well, there are things removed by the HVAC system, but you know, if we're looking for the needle in the haystack, what's in the haystack? So it turns out that the great indoors was uncharted territory. Remember, I'm supposed to be working on things that other people don't know about or haven't thought about. And I learned that people spend 23 hours a day indoors, and there's gazillions and gazillions of microbes in the room. Remember, I got the microscope back and I don't remember what Christmas. Okay, and hum it turns out humans have this, whole, are composed of three times as many microbial cells as human cells. Okay, they're our friends, they're not just germs. In fact, our human microbiome weighs three pounds as much as our brain. Gee, and all those antibiotics I've been taking for years, I don't know, is that, have I been doing myself uh, a service or not? And it just shows that over time, science, you learn things and realize you were doing things the wrong way. And again, I'm not against all antimicrobials, but maybe we don't need broad spectrum. So anyway, so here we are, we're all in this room, we're shedding, well, I, I could give you some of the results, we're already shedding millions of microbes, uh, and we're also acquiring them. Okay, so, but how, why could I study this now? As opposed, why didn't people study this before? All right, so back in Louis Pasteur and the microscope people, uh, they would basically take a sample, 
put it on a, a plate and grow it, okay? So they only studied things you can grow. If I, so if I had a garden and only could study things that I could grow, then most things I couldn't grow, all right? So, um, so when scientists were sequencing the human genome, oh, and I forgot to, oh, wait, I forgot to tell you something important back here. I'm with one at, I'm with Craig Venter. He's perhaps the most world, world famous scientist. Um, he, I, I can't believe, because you don't know, he's, I'm with a rock star in this picture, okay? Later on, go look up J. Craig Venter. He's, and he was my first grantee that I got to move from an outdoor environment to an indoor environment. And he's right now trying to get algae to make um, jet fuel. All right, so anyway, let's go back. Okay, so when he was in competition with the NIH, um, he actually sequenced the human genome faster than the NIH, but it would look bad to the taxpayers, so they um, declared a victory. So he then started using these techniques to study natural environments, and he discovered that seawater, particularly the Sargasso Sea, the sea around the Bermuda Triangle, um, was, t was filled with microbial life that he could de detect using DNA-based methods. So I... Again, remember, I give away money for a living. Most people will take my call. So we invited in uh, Dr. Venter to give a talk. He gives this, this wonderful talk about his most recent work. And we said, how'd you like to work indoors? He said, I'd love to. So anyway, he was my first grantee. Now, why is this important? Because the buildings are going to shape the microbes that are in it. And if we go back to really elementary stuff, if you have water in your house, you get mold. So that's elementary microbiology of the built environment. But we actually don't know much about that because we never actually isolated indoor molds. That's a separate thing. But anyway, the findings that my grantees will have will ultimately may influence how we design, construct, and operate buildings. So let me give you a few. All right, so here's the little house. We have the person there. We've got microbes coming inside from the HVAC. She's shedding things like 28 million microbes an hour, either from her or from the carpet. Oh, but we don't have a carpet in here, so it's probably less. How many people are in here? I know we've got people good in math, but we won't calculate how many new microbes we have. Okay, now water, microbial life is everywhere. It's in water. Drinking water is not sterile. It never has been. It never will be. So here's some science that shows that the water that, and so just look at the colors are, are a proxy for different types of microbes comes into the treatment plant, it comes out, comes out of your tap, it changes. So you want to change your water flow in a green building. You want to reduce your water heater to save energy. Is that a good idea? I don't know. I have grantees studying that. But one of the things other scientists have learned that environmental exposures are important for health. I started talking about that human microbiome. It's really important. Okay, so we study all sorts of places, schools, insect infested homes because again you're gonna if you have a cockroach and bed bug infested home you're gonna have a lot more moisture moisture means more microbes can live so it's important and again air water surface and inhabitants again one of the grantees in Oregon they're studying a hospital room here they're studying a green building here's one of their sampling remember I'm a scientist I've got to have science in the talk okay here's a, a graduate student looks like he's vacuuming but he's actually doing sample collection Here's one of the professors um, collecting samples. Okay, now we've talked about microbes. Uh, many people worry about microbial disease, and again, it's good we have some antibiotics. But remember, microbes are responsible for bread, cheese, wine, beer, all sorts of fermented foods. So I, this is actually taken from a recent site visit to another one of my grantees. But I, but. Often when you're studying people's facilities, they don't want, they want it to be anonymous. Because like when you, if you discover bad things or things they want to change, they don't want their customers to know. But anyway, so we're studying a winery here. Okay, so I could show you all more data, but I think that a number of people here would like, oh God, you know, she showed, it was this interesting when we were talking about the bioterrorism and the camels, but now, so anyway, I'm just going to show you results that were so interesting that new, national news stories picked up. So... This is studying homes. And so the interpretation of the paper was, you live in your own germ cloud. Here's another one. I stayed in a hotel room last night. Hotel rooms aren't yucky. You colonize them with your own personal bacteria within hours. Now, 
These are headlines based on a very important paper that one of my grantees, Jack Gilbert from the University of Chicago, just published in Science, one of the leading journals. So it's a big deal. Here's another um, important finding from my grantees. When babies are born, they basically don't have any microbes. They don't have a human microbiome and they have to acquire them. Neonate, babies that are premature have all sorts of terrible problems and they give them broad spectrum antibiotics just to save them. So if you're studying these babies that have no microbes and you study the room, you're like, well, what happens? Well, it turns out that these babies get in, these, in the uh, neonatal intensive care unit, get some of their microbes from the sink. And I don't know if that's good or bad. It's, that's what I'm saying, we're just learning. Okay, so now we're gonna get, remember I'm a feminist, so let's get back to feminism, sexism, and fighting it in science. One size does not fit all. All right, so I travel all around the world, I get all of these t-shirts. Do you realize how many men's extra large t-shirts I've gotten rid of? I can't stand it. Okay, so I run a scientific program. What a surprise, I can find brilliant women to be PIs and so on. But anyway, so there's a, in this particular case, I ordered, or I should say my assistant who's here, we ordered t-shirts. And we ordered t-shirts, both women's t-shirts and men's t-shirts. And you know what, in this case, both the women and the men, they're wearing a shirt that fits. Isn't that amazing? Unlike this picture of me in Hong Kong, where I put the shirt on, and the grantees are like, oh, come on, Paula. So anyway, there I am in Hong Kong, to, again, on a business trip, wearing the shirt they gave me. But you know what? I couldn't pull it down over my hips. So anyway, that group, clearly I didn't give a big enough grant. All right, so let's talk about advancing science, and it's actually advancing scientists. Here's a group of uh, people, scientists, that work in my program. I want you to look at the picture and decide who you think is going to be the important scientist whose work I'm going to study next. But don't you, don't you don't have to give me the answer. Now, it turns out, but again, you, it's a pretty diverse, for, this is, I'm proud of this picture because I have two women, including a black woman, two Hispanics, a gay man, an, an old white guy, and a young white guy. All right. But you know what? They're all brilliant scientists, okay? So I think that's important to remember, that you, brilliance can be everywhere. All right, so it turns out, okay, so people, um, there's a thing called unintended bias. And the first place that people, there are a lot of people in music at this school. So orchestras for the longest time were all men. And of course, when you listen, isn't that an unbiased listening? Well, when they change the auditions, put up curtains and told the people auditioning to take your shoes off. Suddenly, women were getting places in orchestras. Wow, it's amazing. Their, women's music got better when they were behind the curtain. Or they were victims of bias. And when you saw the woman playing the violin, it just didn't sound as good as the man playing the violin. Oh, but the scientists, we're better than that. We wouldn't do this. We're totally objective. So. Um, a professor, Joe Handelsman, a woman, a very prominent woman at Yale, professor who's actually now a science advisor in the White House, she did a study. She took um, some, seat, some resumes uh, that were identical, except it was like John Jones, Jennifer Jones, or whatever. They, and they, they tested names that were like bland. And they sent these resumes to all sorts of scientists who were looking to hire. So everything is ex the same except the first name. And the, boy, the boy's resume, they said he was smarter than the girl's resume. They gave him more money, and it's the same resume. They haven't talked to anyone. So all I can say is we all commit unintended bias, and you have to learn about it so that you don't do it. And so I now, with all of the people I'm funding and whatever, because people want money from the Sloan Foundation. So even I do it. So anyway, all right, so the answer to the question is the blonde woman is the PI of the study I'm talking about. Now this is fun. This is a trip I didn't take. I did not go to South America. But I've already told you that buildings have microbes and people have microbes. And so... Uh, this professor said, I'd like to study homes in the Amazon. So if you look at the picture here, you start with a grass hut, 
okay? And the smoke, the stove is in there, the people all live in there. Then you go to these buildings where they have electricity but they don't have running water. You go to this building where they, you know, they're still in the jungle, it's still the same climate. Uh, they have running water and um, electricity. And then you go to, oh, the, a mouse. Okay, so now what's different here? Between the, so looking at culture, the diets are different. The people living in the jungle, they don't have heart disease, they don't have diabetes, they can die early on of certain um, infectious diseases, but if they make it through that, they're very healthy as opposed, oh gee, please, I'm giving, got to go back here. All right, um, so what influence, so we know that the people are shedding microbes, we know the buildings have microbes, so again, do the people have different microbes? The people take different medicines, and the, and the people in the jungle are using tropical medicines. We're having all these pills. You know, the people in the jungle, they actually work for a living here. We've got to go to the gym to get exercise because we're in offices, and their houses are different. So, now this is where I need a lot of brilliant people um, because the results look like this, and you need statisticians and all sorts. Of, but anyway, basically, the houses that are in the more modern world have more microbes than the people and outdoor and the old, the houses in the jungle are uh, more like the natural world but we don't know what it means and we don't we have to study the pe the pe results on the people aren't ready yet okay so let's talk about I, again i've been inspired and i continue to be inspired and i say future generations hey i'm a grandmother okay so i had to put my granddaughter in the talk because again I, you know, I gave that speech at Stoughton High School in 1971 about sexism. I've already told you we still have these problems. Like when I was like, ha when I would be having all these fights about things that are unfair to women, I say, you know, at least my daughters won't have this problem. Now I'm saying, will my granddaughter? Oh, gee, what is this saying? Oh, gee, is this like? Oh, wait, stay connected. Okay, it's gonna be okay. Gee. Okay, so anyway, I think we'll end things here. I want to thank my family, and here they are. And that was just my husband, daughters, and my sons-in-laws, but I have my extended family is here, friends, colleagues, mentors, students, teachers, and staff, and now I will answer any questions you have. Okay, right here. You have to stand up so I can hear you. I'm old. Have I what? Have I ever what? All right. Are we going to start in eighth grade when someone else got the top student award? Are we going to talk about junior and high school when I lost the election for uh, vice president in my class? Okay, so I've had tons of rejection, but who wants to listen to someone going, oh, I suffered here, I suffered there. I had tons of rejections. All right, you have to, I'm giving you the follow-up. I have to say that rejection inspired me to do better. It just, it, it's like, I, this is ridiculous, I have to do better. So I used it as a tool to do better. All right, over here. And am I in exhibiting unintentional bias? Okay. You think, you think going to soil is going to All right, yes, uh, yes, okay. And I'll give you an example of one of my grantees, Nancy Kelly, okay? Nancy has, um, has three children at age like 18. You know, she graduated from high school, has three children, and she goes to a community college in Connecticut. She graduates at the top of her community college and then transferred to Yale, okay? So this is a mother, she's married, she's got three kids, but she's studying day and night at the community college. She transfers to Yale. Now I start thinking, I'm sorry for my, you know, self, gee, I'm like, a junior at Yale, I've got the boyfriend, I've got to study. She's got a husband and three kids and has to get through Yale. She went to Harvard Law School. She's now one of the most successful uh, people I know. She's developed biotech labs in New York. Her name is Nancy Kelly. She's great. So, but it's, you know, it's not where you start, but it's where you finish. But whatever, you, whatever card you're dealt, you have to go for it. Okay, now I'm going over here. 
I can't even see who's asking me questions. Okay, it's, all right, here. Where are the girls' questions? Okay, go ahead. Excuse me? Did they take what? Right. All right. So the Sloan Foundation had a 10-year program called the Census of Marine Life. And so we, um, and my colleague Jesse Ossabeld, so I know lots of people who study fish. I think there, you should study what you're interested in and be good at it. Okay? So, you know, so I, I know people who study fish. It's important. So, but, but study what you're interested in, be good at it. But again, unless you work hard, you're not going to be good at it. That's true in sports, music, or studying. All right, I need, to, I need some help with questions. Okay, back there. Okay. All right, feminist. It's like, because there are a lot of people who are scientists, a lot of people have fundraisers, but it's just like, people will not stand up for these things. I'm 61 years old, I can't believe I'm still having these fights, but I'm doing it. All right. We have time for two more questions. All right. I, it's like, I feel like no one, okay, over here. Somebody stand up, because I have the bright lights on me. Okay. All right. All right, I, I need to, all right. How would you what? If you're very good on the internet, you'll figure it out, but far more money than most houses cost in the United States. If you're good on the internet, you'll find out how much I make. And it's a lot of money. And that doesn't include my expense account. Please quiet down. As I need, I have a question here. Okay, so the question was about giving girls more money than boys to college. All of the fundraising I do, it just like goes to the institution and they dole out the money. And the, the point about the need-based aid is the people who need the aid should get it, okay? And so whether they're boys or girls. I worry more that make sure the girls are being treated fairly, are not overlooked, are not invisible. And again, that, that, exa that resume study is troubling. All right, you can look at my email address. If you can spell Olsuski, Olsuski at Sloan.org. If you send me a question, I'll answer it. Thank you very much. At this time, I'd like to call Dr. Rizzi to the stand for closing remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your kind attention. Did you learn something? Yeah. So, there's something I'd like you to remember when you leave here, after you leave here, the rest of the year, and after that. The world belongs to you. You can do whatever you want. If you've found your passion, great. If you haven't, you will. You can do anything you want in this world and we will help you. Have a great day. One more round of applause for Dr. Paula Ozuski.
At this time, we're going to dismiss orderly from the auditorium. All right, so stay in your seats until you are called. We're going to start.